Wait, do that again. Um, Navy veterans, I know there's at least one in the audience, uh, along with myself, Na the word Navy is actually an acronym. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the last question that was asked, I think Brother Brewer didn't really have a chance to get to it about whether you have to know you're a member of the church for your salvation to be effective. I got to thinking about it, and yesterday I, I asked Michael if I could take that question. He said, yes, you can, because you're going to have the open forum. Na Navy, stands for, Navy stands for never again volunteer yourself. <laughs> I haven't learned that question. I haven't learned it. The first question we have here is, is, in your understanding, what is necessary for one to know, what is necessary for one to know in order to become a Christian? In other words, what would be the basics that a person must understand to become a Christian? Well, the, the first part, I understand what they're asking, but my, my understanding has nothing to do with it. It's, it's obviously what the Word of God has to teach. And that's what we go by. Colossians 3.17, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. So we must always look to the word of the Lord to find out what it is we're supposed to do. In regards to Bible study, when we read the Bible, when a person read, just simply read, sits down and reads the text of the Bible, open it up and just start reading. When you read those words, if you'll take those words in their common everyday meaning, that if you would, that you, as you would use them in a conversation, as you would read in the newspaper, as you would read in a, in a regular magazine, um, and, lest, and you would understand them that way, unless there's something in the context that would cause you to, that would cause the words to stop meaning, ma making any sense. Um, when, when Jesus called Herod a fox, well, was Herod a fox? Was he had a little black feet and a pointy nose and a long bushy tail? The, the answer is no. That would be silly. When Jesus said, I am the door, was he literally meaning a door with hinges and handles? And, no, that's, that's obvious. That renders the, the passage nonsensical. So there's, there is a, 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 it's not a literal, it's a figurative meaning at that particular point. So as we read the Bible, we need to just simply look at the words and apply them in their common everyday meaning. So, as we look at this, what must I understand? <clears throat> uh, let me give you a, 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 a comment here. It, it, God exists, the Bible is His Word, and only those that believe in, love, and obey the Bible as the Word of God have any hope of heaven. Again, God exists, the Bible is His Word, and only those that believe in, love, and obey the Bible as the Word of God have any hope of heaven. First of all, God exists. There's only two... And you must understand this. You must acknowledge it as the truth, not as your feeling, as your hope, as your belief, but you must know this to be the case. There's only about two, two basic models for, to account for existence, that, that matter is eternal, and science teaches us that it is not. I'm not a scientist. I, I've never really studied it as a scientist would, um, but uh, I, guess, I think it's the law of thermo, thermodynamics, and the law of entropy teaches that that the earth is slowing down and deteriorating. So somewhere back up the road, it was really doing well, and now it's not doing quite as well, and later on down the road, it's just going to grind to a stop in some form or fashion. And that's what science teaches us. This, the second model, there's, or the second possibility, as, is that there was once nothing. Now, if matter is not eternal, if matter has not always been in some form or fashion, then there was once nothing. And if that is the case, why is there now something? There ha the laws of physics, as we know them and understand them, cannot account for non-existence. And now we have existence. Louis Pasteur, back in the 1800s, proved that gener spontaneous generation does not exist. It does not happen. He did an experiment, took meat, sterilized a couple of bottles, with a, with a gooseneck in it, and he put these, this meat uh, down in, the, in these bottles, and some of them he stopped up and put filters on and stuff, and they were wondering where flies came from, basically, and they, they realized that flies did not have, have access to some of these bottles that were stopped up and filtered that flies couldn't get to. So spontaneous generation is not the answer, and there are people that are relatively intelligent that say, oh, yes, it does. Well, no. I mean, just no. 
So how do you account for existence? Well, there had to have been some force, some mind, some intelligence, some something that brought all this into existence. Now, without going into any more detail than that, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. You have force, you have time, you have energy, you have matter. It all came into existence. Now, uh, and that's really as far as we'll take that particular part of it. Uh, in in the, uh, the, the, the lectures we've had, we've had some... Uh, uh, two, two excellent lectures dealing with worship. Uh, we've had an excellent uh, lesson that dealt with how we got the Bible. Uh, Brother Post talked about, about inspiration of the Bible. Uh, the Bible, we can validate the, the Bible being authentic. Uh, we, look at, we look at prophetical statements, uh, how prophecy deals with uh, uh, how the Bible has come about because of prophecy. Um, and what the example was given, and I forget now who gave it yesterday, the day before, about covering Texas with silver dollars and then reaching into the, and find the one that was, that was painted red or marked in some fashion. Somewhere out there in the nether regions of Texas, you go out there and put your hand down one time and pick out that particular uh, uh, silver dollar. Um, so, you know, the prophecy indicates to us that, that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God because the probabilities of just one prophecy applying specifically to one person is is rare and then when you get eight of them that's just really like point zeros way out there to the right somewhere uh so the bible can be validated the bible scientifically teaches you know what it teaches scientifically all the paths of the sea for instance um job i think it is talks about all the water flowing down into the sea and then there's the evaporation the, by implication and it hits the clouds and goes back and starts that whole cycle all over again so scientifically medically um, the Bible is valid because we have them practicing sanitation uh, back in the book of Leviticus. That when, when, uh, when it came down to, to isolating and quarantining those with leprosy in central um, north, no, south central Europe at the top of Italy in that area and there, there was, back in the 13th or 14th century, there was a, an outbreak of leprosy. And some good soul was reading the Bible and, and, and read through Leviticus and found out this is what they did back then. Let's do that. Well, it worked. How, how did Leviticus, how did Moses know that? Well, there's no way he could have known it on his own. He had to have it by inspiration. Okay, we can give a number of examples like that, and I'll leave it up to the questioner and all those that are interested to, to look into that particular part of it. But once we validated that the Bible is, in fact, that God exists, the Bible is his word, then the next thing for us is to simply look at what the words of the Bible actually say. That we are, that, that this God, that it now exists, a deity, has created us in such a way that he's able to communicate with us. I've actually had people tell me, well, I don't believe in God. Well, why not? Well, because he's so, he's so above us, as the Bible describes it, which I find interesting. How do they can understand that? He is so high above us that he wouldn't be able to communicate to us. Well, that's just blasphemy. I'm thinking if he could make us in the first place, he should be able to at least talk to us, poke us in the side, get our attention in some form or fashion. Well, he has communicated to us. Again, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Uh, Matthew chapter 17, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, hear ye him. Hebrews chapter 1, uh, God has spoken unto the prophets and fathers in divers manners, now has spoken unto us in these last days by his son. Well, if, he, if we can't understand that, how can we understand that? And, and we have the communication, it's here for us to read, we just simply read it in its common everyday meaning and then apply the lessons that we've learned. So what does, what does the Bible tell us about salvation and what we must do? Well, just, just uh, uh, very basically, uh, I've got two lessons on the church coming up, one this afternoon and one tomorrow, dealing with some of these very issues. Um, the fact is, is that, uh, and, and just going over this kind of quickly, if I were to have a chart up here on this one side over here, I'd put Isaiah chapter 2, verses 3 through 4. And if you turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, or if not, just listen to me. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. And men and people shall go and say, Come ye, let us, go up, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now I've got that on the right hand, excuse me, the other right hand, the left hand side of the, of the chart. On the right hand side of the chart, in the extreme margin, I'd write out there 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Now keep in mind what Isaiah said, the house of the, of the God of Jacob. All right, 
over here in, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 15, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of God, uh, church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. The house of God appears over here in Isaiah in a prophecy. Over here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, 15, about 700, uh, about 810 years later, Paul writes down and talks about the house of the God of Jacob. Now, Jesus in Matthew chapter 16, 18, well, if you... Uh, a little bit before that, up in verse 13, he's talking to the apostles, and he's come to them and said, whom, uh, when Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And of course, they gave the opinions of what people said. And Paul, uh, Jesus said, whom say ye that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I, will, uh, and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this foundation, his confession that Jesus was Christ, the living God, I will, build, I will build my church, and the gates of hell, or Hades, the American Standard Version, shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and, whosoever, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and, what, and so forth. Now, that is significant because it introduces an organization that Jesus said he will build. Now, why is that important? Why would he talk about an organization that isn't, that isn't all that important in the first place? Well, I'm thinking if anything the Lord says has some kernel of truth and interest in it for even the, the most uh, uh, least interested among us. John chapter 3, verse 5. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born, if and only if a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now keep in mind that Jesus said, I will build my church, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. Now the keys of the kingdom is, is, is the, the facts that tell people how to enter into the kingdom. It's the information that was given. Um, in, uh, in, at the end of Ma uh, Matthew 16, 28, at the end of Matthew chapter 16 and verse 28, he says, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they, she, till they shall, excuse me, till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. In Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, he says basically the same thing, but at the end of that particular section, he says that there be some of them standing here that shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, Jesus has promised to build a, a, a church uh, he is, then he's going to give the keys to the kingdom to people. He has told those folks standing there that some of them would be alive when they saw the kingdom come, and they would see it come with power. So when they saw the power come, they would see the kingdom arrive. Now over in Luke chapter 24, verse 49. And by the way, to those listening to this, if you would like a further discussion of this, I'd be glad to. You could probably email here, and, and Michael will give you my email, and I'll, I'll get in touch with you if you want to continue this conversation. In Luke chapter 24, verse 46, Jesus says, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Go back to Isaiah chapter 2, verses, not right now, but just keep in mind, go back to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. That from Zion would go forth the law. Jesus said, from Zion shall go forth the law, but he said it this way. That, uh, and, that, remission of, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And notice again in Isaiah that all nations would go up to the mountain of the house of the Lord. That's crucial. And he says, you are witnesses of these things. In verse 49 he says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem till ye be endued with power from on high. Go back to ch Mark chapter 9 and verse 1. They would see the kingdom come with power. When the power came, the kingdom came. And you cannot divorce the two and still remain logical and rational and not have us look at you rather strange when we just look at the common words. In Acts chapter 1, in Acts chapter 1, um, verse 4, um, being assembled together with them, this is after the, ascension, this is after the, uh, the uh, resurrection, the, after the 40 days, and just prior to the ascension. Uh, commanded them, the meeting with the apostles, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized, ye, the apostles, with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 7 says, It is not for you to know the times, they, they asked when the, the king would be restored at that point. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put into his own power, but ye shall receive power 
after that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, what was going to come with power? Upon those that were then standing there in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1? It would be the kingdom. Jesus is talking to those that were standing there when he said that in Mark 9 verse 1 and also a, a, a comparative statement in, Mark, in, in Matthew 16 and verse 28. That they would be standing there. That they would receive the power. Jesus says, not many days hence. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the most parts of the earth. Again, all those nations and so forth. Now, did the power come? The answer is yes. Look at Acts chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. And when the day of, excuse me, Brother Brewer was talking about this the other night. If you look at the end of, 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 of chapter 26, Acts chapter 1, let's just read that together. And they gave forth their lots, the eleven, and the lot fell upon Matthias, now totaling twelve, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, the apostles with Matthias, twelve guys, twelve men, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It wasn't, it just as sounded like it. Filled all the house where they, the apostles, were sitting. And there appeared unto them, apostles, cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they, the apostles, were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Them, the apostles. What happened when the Holy Spirit came? The Holy Spirit would come with power. What were they going to see come with power? The kingdom. Did the power come? Yes, the kingdom also came. People have to know that. They have to know that. Now, what's the significance of all of that? If you continue on in Acts chapter 2, repentance and remission of sins among all nations is begun to be preached in this particular passage. Peter begins in his sermon in Acts chapter 14. He runs down through the end of that thing, and he convinces the people that they have just murdered the Messiah, the man they have been waiting for for lo these thousands of years. In verse 37, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What did Peter say? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What? Yes. What are we going to do? We murdered the Messiah. What are you going to do this? That's Peter's response. And with many other words, he continued to exhort them, verse 40 and 41. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word. There's a whole lot of folks there that received the word. There's a relatively speaking handful of those people that gladly received it. How do I know that? It says that, but how do I know they received it? Um, and they and received his word, were baptized. There's a whole lot of folks that weren't baptized. Now, I'm glad 3,000 were. Oh, 3,000 souls the day of Pentecost. Out of how many? Well, a whole lot more than 3,000. But those 3,000 did gladly receive it. And I'm glad to say a whole bunch of them followed along as time went on. Now, what happened to those folks that gladly received the word? Verse 42, it says, They continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking the bread and prayer. Those people had to know who and what they were. They had to know that they had just received remission of sins because they asked what they were going to do. How do we get over murdering the Messiah? Well, you repent and be baptized for remission of your sins. Well, okay, I can do that. And then what happens? They continue steadfast in apostle, doctor, fellowship, breaking the bread and prayers. And he goes on down to verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Why is that significant? Jesus said, I will build my church. Paul says in 1, Thess 1 Timothy 3.15, uh, he talks about the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. So between Isaiah and, and 1 Timothy, Jesus comes along in Matthew 16, says, I'm going to build it. Over here in Acts 2, verse 47, we not only have it built, we have folks entering, entering into that thing. How did they get there? They got there by doing what the apostles said to do. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It happened. They knew what they were doing. How? Because they continued steadfastly in it. You don't, you know, after a while, you're walking down the road and you think, you know what, I think we've just come too far. We've missed our turn. And my wife says, you should have turned back a mile ago when I told you to. Well, somewhere along the line, those folks are going to figure out, you know, what are we doing? And they're going to get the information they needed. Now, um... It talks about remission of sins. What is it that washes my sins away? I don't know of any Bible student of any level, uh, that's a serious Bible student of any level, that wouldn't answer, well, the blood of Jesus, and they'd be right. The blood of Jesus was shed in his death. John chapter 19, verses uh, uh, 34, 36, down through verse 39, when Jesus has died, 
The soldiers come along breaking the legs of the two uh, miscreants on either side of him. And they come to Jesus and they see, they see he's dead already. What did they do? The soldier took his spear, pierced his side. What happened? Blood and water came out. When did the blood and water came out? When they pierced his side. When did they pierce his side? After he had died. His blood was shed in his death. What's the significance of that? Zechariah 13.1. There's a fountain going to be opened up in Jerusalem for their remission of sins. That's what Zechariah says. That's, that's kind of a rough accounting of it, but that's what it says. Now, why is that significant? Well, where does your blood flow? Your blood flows in you. And as, as long as you're relatively speaking healthy and no open wounds in your body, it's flowing in you. Now, if Jesus' blood flows in Jesus, where do I need to be? I need to be in Jesus. Now we find, uh, we're just going to have to go quicker than what I had originally thought, but we're going to go quicker still. In, um, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse uh, 22 and 20, 23, well, okay, let's, let's look first at Romans chapter 6. Let's go to Romans chapter 6, verses uh, 16 through 18. What then shall we, or verse 15 says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under the grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin and of death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sins, but ye have obeyed. That's, I'm not much of an English guy, but I know that's past tense. That is something that has happened in the past. But ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered you being then made free from sin. When was I made free from sin? I've, I've opened this up, and what I like to do is have people, I turn, like to have people turn in their own Bibles and read the passage out loud to me. They'll read that out loud to me. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. What happened? When were they made free from sin? Well, I don't know. Read verse 17. When they obeyed from the heart, the form of doctrine delivered. What was the form of doctrine delivered? Romans 6, 3 and 4. Just look at that. Just read it again. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death, and like as Christ is raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Well, why am I baptized into Christ? Where does blood, Christ's blood flow? It flows in him. If I'm going to contact his blood today, I must be where it is. Where is it? It's in him. How do I get in him? I'm baptized into him. In Galatians chapter 3, 26 through 27, at 28, it says about the same thing. We've been baptized into Christ, we put on Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. What body is that? The body is the church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. The body and the church are one and the same. Colossians 1, 18 reverses that order. It's the same organization, it's the same thing. It's also the kingdom, going back to Matthew 16. I must know those things. Why? Because where, where does the blood flow? It, it, it flows in Jesus. Paul in Acts 22, 16, accounting his... his um, uh, uh, the, the point in time when he obeyed the, the, the doctrine of Christ, uh, Ananias had come to him, and he said, And now why tearest thou? Rise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, wait a minute, I don't believe in water salvation. I don't either, and I don't, as far as I can know, I don't, uh, I'm aware, I don't know of any, any Bible student or faithful Christian that believes we're saved by water. We're not saved by water. Peter said it's not the washing away the filth of flesh, but the answer for clear conscience. How does my conscience get clear? It gets washed in the blood of the Lamb. When does, when, do my, when, do, when does my soul get washed clean in the blood of the Lamb? It gets washed clean in the blood of the Lamb when I am baptized for the of my sins. That's what Paul said in Acts 22, 16. And, um, and you could, I would encourage you to study Hebrews chapters 9 and 10. It's not possible the blood of bull, bulls and goats can, take away, can, can wash away sins. It takes the blood of Christ. And the only way we contact it is, is in the water grave of baptism. It is a spiritual activity. Our hearts are sprinkled with blood. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, I believe it's verse 21 or 22. Well, all right. Anybody have anything they want to add to that? No, there's a whole lot more. You're not going to do it from there, brother. Okay, I, know, I, just, wanted to, I just wanted to make sure you know. Okay, come, come down here before you start speaking. Tell us who your name and where you're from. Dale Cunningham, Bellevue Church, Dale Cunningham, Bellevue Church of Christ. Turn to Revelation 1-5, and it rhymes with 22-16 of Acts that he just got through reading. And uh, this is from the New King James Version that I'm reading. It'll still be in Revelation 1 5. Though. It reads, Revelation 1 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, 
and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. But he just got through reading where baptism was the washing occurrence. Don't, don't, don't walk away, don't close it. Turn over to Romans, uh, Revelation 7.14. Revelation okay. 7.14. Okay. I have learned something this week. I'm there. Re Revelation 7.14, read that. And I said to him, Sir, you know... So he said to me, these are the ones who came, who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Thank you very much. Now what does that tell us? That tells us, number one, it's a two-part process. It is said in Revelation 1-5 that Jesus washed us in his blood. In Revelation 7-14, it says they washed their robes in his blood. It's a, it's a simultaneous process. But there, there is a... There is a, a a sense that we both, Jesus and we as individuals, I as an individual, are both doing something during the action of baptism. Jesus is doing it to me, but yet I'm doing it to my own robes, my spiritual robes. Ephesians chapter 5 teaches about robes, spot and wrinkle, no blemish and so forth. Would anybody else care to add anything? Okay. Very good. Or you're also stunned, I don't know. Number two, is all use of puppets unscriptural, or is it possible for teaching in Bible classes, not worship? Is the use of Betty Lucan's flannel graph also wrong? What about color slides or videos? In uh, Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse, uh, verse 11, and, gave, and he gave some prophets, gave, excuse me, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The church is a teaching organization. Our job is to evangelize, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Our job is to teach people what the truth is, to live it, to show it by example, and to teach it by precept. Anything we do in, in teaching people that doesn't violate any other tenet of scripture is an expedient. It's an expedient. This, this microphone right here is an expedient in teaching the truth. This building is an expedient in teaching the truth. Uh, uh, a Bible, to a very large degree, is expedient. Many of the brethren here have, have uh, uh, laptops and, and I, excuse me, iPads. I'm sorry, Michael, an iPad. Whew. If I want to get invited back next year, iPad. He uses quite extensively. And um, it doesn't hinder him in his work. <laughs> and he uses that to help him do his job up here. I, I, I'm assuming he uses it when he preaches also. I think I've used, uh, seen, him, seen him do that. So... It's a fact that we can use an expedient. Now, in a Bible class, a Bible class, a Bible class, uh, an expedient that, that is something that doesn't violate scriptures inherently uh, or even instrumentally in the immediate use it would be fine to use. And I don't personally see anything wrong, whether, it, whether it's a, a chart, whether it's something I print out on a piece of paper and hand out, it would be an expedient. Now, as long as I'm teaching the truth in that process in a Bible class, it's an expedient to do those things. Now, what about in worship assemblies? Um, there's been two good lectures delivered on worship. I would encourage you to, to, uh, to read those two lectures. A, a worship assembly is a moment of sacredness. That we are entering into the throne room of Almighty God. That when Joseph was taken out of prison... He changed his clothes and washed himself. Um, when I, it, it seems to me when Daniel was taken out of the lion's den, he also got himself ready before he went into the king. When Nehemiah the cupbearer to the king had a long face, he was in danger of having his head cut off because the king said, why are you unhappy? You're, you're in my presence and you better have a smile on your face. Why are you unhappy? And Nehemiah prayed so that he would say the right thing to the king and not have his head cut off. So when I approach the, the Lord, when I approach the God of the universe, I had better be in a very, very humble situation in my own mind, and I better have prepared myself. I mentioned uh, bib overalls the other day, and also have those top buttons buttoned too, brethren. When we worship God, it is serious. We do not have... We're not here to entertain or to be entertained. I don't want to see your puppets. It's not the time and place for it. Yeah, but people will learn. That's right. They will learn. I'm going to tell you they're probably not going to learn the right things because we won't be showing proper respect. 
Um, Betty Lucan's flannel graphs, I've never used them. I've seen them used. I suppose they're all right in their own place as long as you, uh, the material is appropriate to be used anyway. So I, I can't address that too much. What about color slides or videos? I couldn't tell you a number of people that have been converted from the air of their ways because of the Jewel Miller film strips uh, or the John Hurt uh, Eight Lesson Bible series. Uh, or any of those things like that. I, I see nothing wrong with those, assuming that there's no, no error in and of those things by themselves. Let, let me just say one other thing about worship assembly. Years ago, we were traveling and we're visiting with a congregation. And as I was coming, coming down in through the back, well, it'd be the, the door back there, coming down the aisle, young people, the first two or three rows of pews had the young people. And they're all sitting there dressed nicely and they're sitting there quite college age group. I said, man, this is great, great, it's wonderful. And as I walked down the front, I wanted to shake hands to the preacher and introduce myself since he wasn't looking me up. I happened to look down, and they're all sitting there with their hands folded in their laps, and every one of them had a microphone. There was your chorus. And I said, I said to Jerry, I said, we're not probably going to come back here again. And I got to thinking about that. You know how to break them with that? I'd get me a microphone on the same frequency. And I would give a demonstration on, on sour singing. And they wouldn't know where it's coming from. That's just wrong. Those things are wrong. Um, number three. Oh, anybody have anything they want to add to that? Be glad to hear it. How much more time I got, Michael? How much more time I got? Oh, okay, this one right here. Can a person choose to worship alone and be pleasing to God if he could assemble with the saints? Um... I, I, just just answering that as it's written, the answer is is no. Assuming now, there's some. Let me make some assumptions here, and I'm and if I'm assuming too much, I'm sure we'll be informed of it. The assumption is is that he could, that there is nothing that something didn't come up. I hate that phrase. Well, something came up. Uh, that something hasn't come up, that he otherwise could. He's in good health. He's not contagious. He's got a car that works. He's got gas in it. The road is open and clear. Um, he can get there. Why isn't he there? The question I want to come back, and I would come back and ask this person, well, why aren't you going? Is there some reason prohibiting you from going? And if the answer is no, then you should be assembling with the saints. Now, I'm assuming that there's not anything else involved with this. I learned a long time ago when somebody asks you a question in Bible class, they're not asking you a question in Bible class. They've got an agenda to grind on. Okay? So I'm going to assume that that's not the case, that there's not a situation out there where somebody says, I'll call in and I'll show. So, if the, so to, to make that choice, that yes, they have that power of choice, we're free moral agents, but it is a choice that would be wrong, given my assumptions that I've made here. He would not be pleasing to God. He is not assembling with the saints. He is assembling with himself. I, I, I don't know how you assemble with yourselves, but, you know, now if you're locked in the closet, if you're tied to the wall, if you're prohibited in some fashion from going to services, notice I said service is not going to church, attending worship assembly, then you should be in the worship assembly. And why wouldn't you be? I guess would be my question. Anybody else care to add anything to that? Enlighten us. If I've missed something, I've assumed too much. All right. Michael, you got anything you want to add to it? He's sitting there. I guess the answer is no. Right. Yes. If you're going to gather together, you should. You should. You should what, what, well, let me ask this. Why wouldn't you want to? We were trying out at uh, church up in northern... Virginia, years ago. I was trying out. My wife was along for the ride. <laughs> and and uh, I was told that there was a lady, that we were, they put us up in a motel, and the motel had a, had a, uh, 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 a restaurant that they would uh, pay for the preacher to eat at. And, and they told me that there's this lady, red-haired lady, and she was going to, to be there, and, and she was going to sit down and, and talk with us and get friendly, and then she'd say, do you, does a Christian have to be at Wednesday night Bible classes? <laughs> so we walked in, and sure enough, she was, sitting her, she was sitting right there, and we sat down, and Jerry says, that us? Yes, that's her. So we're sitting there, she comes up, and she says, are you the visiting preacher? I said, yes, ma'am, I am. I stood up and glad handed her and introduced myself. And she, I said, sit down, sit down. So we're sitting down, you like a cup of coffee? Gave her a cup of coffee. 
Yeah, I mean, it was on church's dime. <clears throat> I'm generous, like that way. So uh, we're talking. She's out. Can I ask you a quick question? I said, yes, ma'am, sure, go ahead. She says, does a Christian, does a Christian have to attend Wednesday night Bible classes? And I just looked at her, and I just said, well, sister, can I ask you a question back? Sure. Why would a faithful Christian not want to assemble with the saints and be edified by a sound Bible teacher? And that pretty much ended that conversation. Michael, tell us who you are now. See, he's got his iPad, I told you. Absolutely. I think I've forgotten who I am by now. <laughs> We're trying to I, I'm Michael Hatcher from Bellevue. The person that is being discussed, I guess, uh, and I don't know who it is, but what an attitude that they don't want to meet with the greatest people on the face of the earth. How ungodly is that? <laughs> I, that I don't care about them. Uh, if nothing else, if you're so great, why aren't you there giving you, your, your greatness to them? Yes. <laughs> it might rub off. It might rub off. That's right. Uh, otherwise, you need to be there to be encouraged by other brethren. You need to be there to enjoy that fellowship with the greatest people on the face of the earth. Why would, you, why would anybody want to stay away? And, you know, we talk, do you have to go to the worship service? Well, we talk, how many times have we, through the years, talked about that's the wrong attitude? It's an improper attitude. It's a sinful attitude. We should have the desire to. And we should have the desire to meet with the same. One of the, uh, in psychology and the needs of man, we immediately recognize the need for air and water and food and things like that, but one of them is the need for community. Yes, yes, exactly. Community is association with others. God has provided the Christian a community to associate with. When you shun that community, well, isn't that what withdrawal of fellowship is all about? When we withdraw our fellowship, we are withdrawing that community from that individual to make that individual recognize his sin and thus to repent. If that individual is refusing to associate with the Christians and refuse, refusing his fellowship with them, then he's withdrawn fellowship from them and has no right to. For one thing, if the, and we're assuming that the congregation there is faithful and just and right with God, has no right to. And so there's a lot of other aspects that enter into this other than, you know, you need to be there. Well, yeah, you do need to be there, but there's some other aspects that you need to consider as well. Years ago at the Central Florida Bible Camp, in the kitchen, I don't know what to do now, but the kids used to have to wash, or they were required to wash dishes after every meal when it was their turn, and there's a sign above the sink that says you don't have to wash dishes, you get to wash dishes. You don't, you know, it's, it's like Michael says, if, if, if we truly understand worship, that we are kissing the hand towards the deity of the universe, that being who is infinite in all of his capacities, that created this perfect plane of existence, that sent his son to die. Paul says, I, I'm crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, that's, you can't get any more personal than that. Okay. And, and it, it just seems to me that, that I want to be there and thank him. Thank you for saving me and thank you for keeping me saved, allowing me to have the plan of salvation. Uh, anyways, anybody else have a brief statement? You've got about this many more to go. And it's probably this one now. All right. 
Man, he's taking notes. <laughs> oh, no. I'm Carl Aliff from Bellevue Church of Christ. This will, this pertains a little bit to that question there, about, but what I really wanted to talk about is there was a question Saturday about two Christians wanting to live together and thinking it's all right just because they're not having sex. You know, there was, there was no scriptures given that day about it, but, you know, we look at it like they should have known better being with us. It was a foolish question, but we're told to give an answer to those that ask. And same with not coming to the worship service. People are watching you. Your neighbors watch you. It says uh, to abstain from all appearances of evil, First Thessalonians 5, 22. It says that you may walk honestly towards them that are without. Uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 13. Wherefore it is, meat maketh my brother to offend, I will eat meat no more. At least I, while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to be offended. There's so many scriptures showing that we are a light to the world, and if you put your own light out, you're walking with them, and you're bringing reproach on the church. And it says, giving offense in anything that the ministry not blamed. That's 2 Corinthians 6, 3. Providing this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is ministered by us, providing for honest things not within the sight of the Lord, but also not in the sight of man. So when you do things just because, you know, you say you're not doing something wrong, what would be the difference of you seeing a brother's vehicle outside of a bar and he's saying, well, he was in there, but he wasn't drinking. You know, I mean, it's, it's appearance. You're, you're appearing to be like them. If you there's Isaiah 8, for the Lord spake to me with a strong hand and instructed me not to walk in the ways of this people. We're not to, to appear like them. We're Christians and we should be different. So. Thank you, Carl. There were, there were some uh, passages. I think one of the, the first one, you, the first Thessalonians 5 that you mentioned had been, had been cited the other day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, appearance appearance is uh, is a very serious thing. We we should not behave. And there's always going to be somebody who's going to gainsay whatever you do, think, or say. But accounting for those folks, we should always behave in such a way that nobody can can criticize us. First uh, Peter chapter four teaches that. Yeah, yeah, and and all it takes is just one little thing for somebody to 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 see you do something that you thought was innocent and you had nothing in your mind, and there's you know, you're not going to please everybody, but we need to do as much as we can. Michael, I'll turn it back over to you.